Good afternoon and welcome to today's Supply Chain Talk. Um, I'm Jonathan Morgan, standing in today for um, Duncan Brock from SIP's head office here in um, Eastern on the Hill. It's a very warm day here today. I'm not sure um, where you are, but we're going to be talking a little bit about climate um, on, on the call today. It's good to uh, be here. I've watched lots of these episodes this year and um, really pleased to have the opportunity to to speak. We're a really interactive show. Um, we, we want lots of um, feedback from the audience. If you have any questions or would like to contribute in any way at all to the webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A um, or the chat function. Um, keeping with tradition, um, we have a giveaway. So we have a supply chain talk um, mug, um, which we will award to the most deserving winner, um, whether that's with the best contribution or question um, throughout the webinar today. Last week, we spoke about how blockchain is transforming procurement and supply chain. And this week, uh, we're on a hot topic. We're talking about building and managing a sustainable supply chain. Really looking forward to it. We've got four expert guests with us today who are all eagerly looking forward to um, joining us. Firstly, we've got Michael Bruman, who's head of supply chain for Community Fibre Limited. Then we've got Soraya Karimi Gavlanri, um, supply chain director from Smithfield Foods. We have Dan Withers from Sainsbury's and our sponsor panelist, Anand Medapali, um, who's the chief product officer from Shipio. You'll be getting a chance to meet all of those um, in a few minutes, but firstly, I would like to introduce Michael Bruman from Community Fibre, who has picked um, today's um, news article that we're going to discuss onto the webinar. So, Michael, please come and say hello to everybody. There you are. How are you today? Hi, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks uh, very well. Thank you. Good, good. It's good to see the trumpet in the back there. Um, if, if we run short of content later, we might ask you to play us a tune. Um, <laughs> play, us, play us out, yeah. Okay, great. So, Michael, on a day where Japan is sweltering in the hottest heat wave since records have begun, you've chosen a, a news um, article um, which is titled, Can We Avoid Climate-Related Food Shocks? So, quite topical, very interesting, and a lot of knock-on um, implications for the wider supply chain. But just briefly before we go through it, can you please tell us why you picked it? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think firstly, it's a subject that's close to a lot of people's minds here in the UK, probably across the EU and indeed across the globe. You know, there's a, a cost of living crisis um, and it's intensify intensifying. People are having to make a choice really between eating and heating and I, I read earlier in fact that there's a one in 20 households in Britain have to go the whole day without eating because they couldn't afford food or couldn't get access to food so I thought it would be good to spend a bit of time talking about a really relevant topic wide-reaching impact from local supply chains all the way up to global distributors secondly we're going to be joined hopefully later by um, some panelists who are experts in these industries so we've got Soraya and Dan from the food industry and Anand with expertise in transport visibility so I thought it'd be great to hear from them um, about this recent article about the impacts that are going to be felt in their industries and lastly it's, it's genuinely a, a really fascinating topic I think UK is one global shock away from a food crisis and that was you know, reported by uh, Professor Tim Lang recently from the University of London um, and we import 46% of our fresh fruit uh, of our fresh veg and 84% of our fresh fruit and so we're really close to, uh, you know, running out, uh, running close to the line. And one shock is uh, going to cause a problem. Obviously, we've had the invasion of Ukraine from Russia. That's going to impact our supply chain on um, food in the near future because they, they make up 29 percent of the globe's production of, of wheat. Um, and, and that's caused a surge in energy uh, costs, which has pushed up manufacturing prices around the globe. So while those topics are pretty human factored, um, you know, climate change related there's a, a recent last couple of years, we've had wildfires in America, we've had flooding in China, we've had a drought in South America. As you said, heat wave going through Japan that's you know, disrupting the supply chain over the last couple of years. So a global shock, we're one away from it and it's it's almost inevitable. So 
really what can we as a consumer but also what can we that are charged with the supply chain in our respective industries do to help control this and, and protect against it yeah I, th I think that's a very good way to open the webinar up michael and when you when you use a phrase such as uh, heating or eating it, it really does um bring the ring the alarm bells especially for people with families we're, we're in summertime at the moment but we all know that in the in the northern hemisphere we've we've already gone past the longest day of the year and it won't be long until those cold nights are just around the corner despite the gloomy forecast the un report has suggested some measures could mitigate the negative impacts on food security so i think there is good news at hand and it would be really interesting to bring the other panel members in actually to see um, what some people in the industry are actually doing it. So if I could ask Soraya, um, Dan and Anand to, to join and, and say hello, maybe we can talk about this in a bit more depth. Hello. Hi there. Hi there. So um, welcome to the webinar today. It's really good to have you here. Um, we've got some real specialist knowledge, actually, for what we're talking about. So a uh, great opportunity for you to uh, maybe link to what I just said about, you know, the not so gloomy side of things, how we in the supply chain can help to mitigate the doom and gloom that's out there. Let's look with a, a glass half full on this one, if we could to start with. And um, Soraya, if you could... Um, maybe give us some thoughts about the, the news article and where you stand on it. Yeah, I think it was a very interesting read and, and very um, at the forefront of everyone's mind at the moment, um, especially as uh, Michael mentioned, you know, it isn't just global impact. It's also things like the war, et cetera, that impacts and it knocks onto everything. But um, the only thing for me in life is the only inevitable is change really. Um, and these things are going to change and we're going to have to change with them. Um, those type of topics really excite me in, in the food industry and supply chain because we've been around for many, many years. And I know, I'm sure as the other panellists will agree, we'll adapt again and we'll go again with a new way of working. It's a challenge, but then we all love a challenge in supply chain. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this industry, I don't think so. Absolutely yeah. right. I, I'd agree. So I think change is something that we know is going to happen. Sometimes people don't like it, but we have to deal with it and we have to change in the short term and, and the medium and long term. Uh, what have you done in the in the short term around this topic, Soraya? So for us, kind of specifically to the food industry, we've had to adapt a lot in regards to prices changing for things like feed for animals because of the grains and wheats that are, we're now not coming out of other countries. We are currently looking at a lot of sustainability avenues, and I know we'll touch on that in a bit. Um, but we've had to change not only who we use, what routes we run. Um, we also have to look at what other options we have to maybe move stuff, whether it's road or, you know, shipping. Do we yeah. have to pivot to a different way? And we just have to because we need to bring it over as cost effectively as we can, because as Michael said, a lot of people are struggling to, to consume or be able to afford to consume food at the moment. And we should, as responsible suppliers, do our best to mitigate that as well to consumers. Absolutely. Otherwise, you know, we won't have a business at the end of the day if we are too expensive. So, No, that's that's a very good point. And, and the reach of the logistics side of things is something that I know all parts of the supply chain are seriously considering at the moment and, and looking deeply into. Dan, how are you um, getting on with this at Sainsbury's and what sort of strategy are you taking at the moment? Well, it's been uh, been quite a few, uh, quite a challenging few years, not just obviously the Ukraine stuff, but I think it's uh, much, much broader than just obviously the food side of things. We've seen a lot on kind of um, raw materials as well who knew ukraine had so much raw materials in their in their country and russia combined a significant uh, area so i think it's you know it's challenging and also as well dealing with your suppliers you know and it's not necessarily you think oh my supplier is not based in ukraine or, or russia but guess what their tier two or tier three supplier that provides them is so you know it's quite challenging to keep on top of all of that kind of stuff but uh, again it's just about agility which we've had to get quite used to with with covid um, certainly we did when uh, 
we couldn't get fresh fruit and vegetables out of Spain very easily. We had to look at different modes of transport, as Soraya said, you know, looking to be agile um, and adaptability, really. And I think, you know, I think I saw something from Cranfield University who was saying that, you know, we used to have these kind of blips every kind of five years. Now expect to get them every couple of years, right? So it just means you've got to you've got to set your system up to be agile and adaptable to whatever um, comes your way, whether that's dual sourcing or, or taking different routes to, to market and things like that, and being able to spot the trends before you know as, as they're happening and before they happen as well. It's a very good uh, point that you made about the the tier two and tier three suppliers, and when you're a, when you're a major um, buyer and you know a partner of them, it's really important to consider their needs as well, um, and you know ensuring that they stay alive during um, tough times. Because as you say, these tough times are popping the heads up um, more and more. So the ethical and sustainable side of, of the procurement is something that the profession, I think, is really um, doing well at at the moment. And I know that there are some really good stories around, you know, how how people are helping with cash flow, etc. So that's really good to hear, Dan. Thank you. Um, how have you found things over in uh, Scipio, Anand? And uh, what, what's your view on the um, on the news article that Michael um, chose for us to discuss? Well, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I mean, we, we should be our software provider to help supply chains be very efficient and provide significant visibility into their supply chains, real-time visibility into their supply chains. So obviously, all these topics are near and dear to our heart. In, in terms of the article itself, I mean, obviously, if you think about it, uh, globalization's side effects we are experiencing when something far away in Ukraine is not able to deliver something uh, we are going to be struggling. And this is not true of just uh, food, but every uh, other thing that uh, uh, that we uh, are reliant on right now. I mean, to look at the chip shortage, look at anything else. I mean, uh, Michael at Community Fiber probably can go uh, wax lyrical on all the things that he needs from various parts of the world that he can't source. I attended a webinar recently uh, where McDonald's supply chain officer uh, was on, and he was talking about all the um, disruptions that we've been seeing in the supply chain. And he actually said we at McDonald's started laughing because uh, we, we, the toilet paper being out of stock uh, is a thing for somebody else. But in food industry, we always struggle with these kind of disruptions. All it takes is a fruit fly to show up and an entire crop is done, uh, you know, and, and some, some kind of a swine flu, and then suddenly pork imports are out of the business. So the food industry has experience in dealing with these kinds of things. But this is a new reality where sustainability is a key factor. And when uh, consumers like my daughter, who are very keen to know where the food is coming from, is it a sustainable supply chain that is delivering it? Uh, the points that uh, Soraya and Dan made are very, very valid. You really need to have significant transparency into your supply chain. And I mean by that supply chain suppliers. Uh, some some argued that COVID impacts would have been a little lesser if only the Western manufacturers knew who the second and third tier suppliers were to the Chinese suppliers that they were relying on. So therefore, that transparency all the way down to the second and third tier is super critical. And then, uh, much like other parts of the supply chain, other industries are talking about nearshoring and onshoring. It's time to think about growing our own food a little bit as well, perhaps to avoid these issues of climate change impacts causing shortages like the ones that we talked about. Because think about it, a heat wave was on somewhere else in the world. Today we talked about Japan. It's only a matter of time when one of these calamities is going to hit each and every part of the globe. How are we going to become very, very resilient if we are always going to be dependent on things that are very far away? So that's one. And the second thing is, create incredible transparency into your supply chain and recognize that supply chains are no longer, let's plan the supply chain, play golf, come back and see how our supply chains have behaved. What you plan in the morning is changed by the evening. That means agility, uh, to Dan's point, is a significant requirement in the supply chain as well. No, very good point. Thank you. Uh, Michael, any um, any thoughts on, on what Anand had, had to mention there? Yeah, I think it's um, it was very interesting to to see that there was opportunities to um, you know, build resilience within the food industry and the wider industry. And you know, I think in in terms of opportunities to 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 bridge your supply chain, um, that's obviously one of the solutions 
Um, with food, it's particularly difficult in terms of lead times and uh, and kind of freshness. You can't really build a buffer of stock. You can't put yourself, uh, you know, a year's worth of stock in a warehouse somewhere and hope that you come back to it and it will still be fresh. Um, so really, you know, the, the bridging is a is a is a solution, but I guess it's quite short term in in terms of we still have to find a solution for the climate crisis um, that will ultimately help across the globe you know make, growing our food uh, locally might reduce our reliance on other areas but as you say there's only a set, set time be between crises um it won't be long until the next crisis around uh, that arrives on our shores uh, and that food locally grown will still be reliant on importing i think we're in this global uh, global world at the moment where we have to be um able to work around you know with lots, lots of different industries and lots of different countries and so really i guess our, our opportunity to improve the situation is by um you know solving our own carbon footprint you know, reducing our own car carbon footprint within the industries we work in within the countries that we live and work in uh, but no one can do it alone you know, one, one company halving their carbon footprint isn't going to change the world but if everybody put their own uh, effort towards it then we've got an opportunity i think how, how do you think we'd get there because it's very um, it's very easy to make sound bites, um, but when you have shareholders to to please and budgets to believe on uh, to deliver on, excuse me, um, where where does that sense of corporate responsibility ultimately um, you know lie? How how do we tell that story inwardly um, within our organisations? Really interested to hear um, Soraya what what your thoughts are on that and and Dan particularly. I think um, for us specifically, although yes, it's a corporate business, uh, a lot more of the consumers, um, as was mentioned previous, they want to see a change and they want to know more now than ever, where did it come from? Are you sustainable? Are you, you know, environmentally friendly, that kind of stuff. And that's a message that I don't think can be ignored for too long before yeah. then, you know, board members, directors of businesses are having to say yes, we need to be more conscious now because this is what our consumers want to see and our customers. And that's what I think is inevitable. The customers ask for it more now from, I guess, packaging, recyclable. Um, we have trades of, is this sustainable product? How are you farming? How are you moving your product across the globe? What's your, again, carbon footprint? So I think that's going to be the, the inevitable change because it's been driven more from consumers and customers now. Thank you. Dan, let's let's talk honestly here. There's there's competition. There's big competition. There's price matching going on amongst supermarkets. Um, we started the the webinar with a eat heating or eating debate. How much does it really matter to a Sainsbury's customer um, that the full supply chain um, that goes behind it, and how does that help you um, to be competitive in the market and corporately responsible on it together yeah i think it, i think i agree with soraya i mean it's massive uh, uh impetus from the business itself so you know for, uh, as our business you know plan plan for better we're very much um trying to accelerate net zero to 2035 so it's a key uh, mission for our business um and it's and it's key for uh, for customers and i only think you know it's gonna it's only gonna increase if you'd ask the same question five years ago jonathan you get a very different answer than you would today yeah. so you know and we take it extremely seriously from a procurement perspective we you know we're measuring the carbon cost as well as the fiscal cost and we say to our team you know it's not acceptable not to have what the carbon cost is as well as the fiscal cost of the product um so and it's about working with your suppliers and innovating to try and get those solutions um into place to make sure that it's as cost effective as as, as possible um, and we're, we as a business are doing everything we can to keep the prices as, as low as possible, even with all of the inflation that's going on um, uh, in the marketplace at the moment. So I think it's just going to increase uh, the focus will increase on it uh, even more. And uh, it's what we should be doing anyway. So it's just another challenge, maybe the fourth uh, kind of revolution after the industry. Um, you know, so. OK, that's really that's really good to hear as, you know, somebody with two daughters and you know, we, we do think about the future and it's good to know that that is being considered. It's um, it's nice and time is flying by. So I think we're going to um, draw that one to a halt. But thank you all 
for your co contributions there. We're going to move on to the um, the, the main um, topic of chat. Um, and we really like some questions here from, from the audience, if, if we have any. Um, so we're going to talk about building and managing a supply, a sustainable supply chain. Um, just to start with, um, how are, organ how are organisations working to improve the environmental footprint of supply chains and cutting greenhouse gas emissions? And I think, think Dan's alluded to sort of what they're doing um, at, at Sainsbury's there, but, but this doesn't need to just be around um, food. This is an open um, discussion now on the sustainable uh, supply chain. So, Michael, if you'd like to kick us off with this one, please. Yeah, I think it's um, there's no there's no silver bullet um, for you know, reducing your greenhouse gases within your supply chain, um, and it's going to be a lot of small actions that add together. Uh, whether that's reverse logistics, whether it's you know, streamlining your deliveries, looking right back up to the raw materials, and, and buying from less less polluting materials, reducing packaging waste, it all adds up. Um, and you know, we're, we're taking steps forward. We've got a green team at Community Fibre. We're really focusing on um, on our sustainability. We're bringing in electric vehicles. We're you know, working really closely with the manufacturers to reduce packaging waste, to reduce the, the polluting materials that go into them. Um, and just looking really at that longer term view of how we can, as a company, can make a difference and, and leave behind uh, in terms of waste as little as possible while still being able to deliver and we've touched on that already from you know a shareholder uh, perspective so uh, as I said I don't think it needs to be a, a silver bullet uh, I think everything uh, adding together is going to make the big difference. Okay and Anne would you like to uh, to build on that what are your thoughts? Listen this is not an option anymore uh, if it, uh, sorry I mentioned it the best way at the end of the day, organizations respond to their end consumers. Uh, those are the key stakeholders. And it, it used to be that supply chains were managing costs and that's what, and, efficient, and, and operations. It moved to shareholder focus when uh, profitability became an imperative. And now it is a stakeholder focus because the end consumers actually have a say in how you run your supply chain. They want to know. You cannot hide behind four walls saying it's a black box. It's frontline news. I mean, New York Times, for the first time admitted that they now have a desk for, sup for supply chain related issues. So this is a household item, this is a kitchen table conversation. So there's no surprise about what needs to happen in the supply chain. 60% of an organization's uh, emissions are typically related to supply chain. 90% of global emissions are because of supply chain. So this is, this is an issue that is going to be regulated if organizations don't take this very seriously and start doing it today. And the way to do that is, all of the above uh, kind of a mentality. But one of the things that they can do is now with technology, it is possible to really know where your shipment is at any point in time. It is, it is an opportunity to know, you really can plan how you want your shipment to go from A to B. It used to be cost was the primary thing. Then the Amazon effect took place and speed became the thing. How fast can you deliver? And now there's a third vector in that decision-making. What's my carbon footprint? And I wager that if you put these out, like an airline, when you finish booking an airline ticket, they ask you, do you want to offset by contributing some? That kind, that 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 mindset is already prevalent in, in all of us. I bet you, if you say that, hey, guess what? If if you can wait for a little bit longer, we can actually offset some carbon, and hence you will be able to, uh, you know, help with the environment. People are going to listen. I mean, just look at the startup that started in. The, Arkansas that is doing that uh, to manage the emissions in the last mile. Imagine if, uh, you know, I don't want to put Sainsbury's on the spot, but if Sainsbury's, Tesco's and Marks and Spencer and all these guys for, for my town, Richmond, decide that in Richmond, the last mile deliverables will all be, we, let's coordinate and actually deliver them together to reduce the footprint. It will have a massive impact and people will listen. I will wait for five hours if that is necessary. If somebody can tell me we will deliver it within that half an hour band, as opposed to what I'm told today for any deliverable, wait at home since from eight till four, and we will figure out a time. That's that's where the world is. And I really believe organizations have a unique opportunity to make carbon footprint a central theme of their decision-making as to how their supply chain is designed and how their supply chain is operated. 
I think uh, that that's a good point, and and we've all felt the frustrations of long windows. Dan, I can't not include you on uh, a response to to Anand's um, point there. And uh, yeah, what's your view on it? Yeah, I completely agree. And you know, when people talk about supply chain and understanding your supply chain, even without the carbon challenge that we've got, if you ask a lot of people, like, how does a supply chain run? You know, are you making loads efficiently? Are you filling the containers full? Are you transporting as much from A to B? You know, uh, uh, I mean, it's still complicated there. So there's loads of opportunity to reduce the carbon footprint, but actually take cost out of the business as well. So where you've got these challenges and risks, the good thing about supply chain logistics is normally always an opportunity if there's a, a risk or a challenge. And, uh, you know, so you have to look at that. So first of all, you have to measure and understand your supply chain and see where your, where your challenges are. Um, and then what you can you do to optimize them to um, increase your loads, take mileage off the uh, off the road, take, uh, you know, ship the consolidate shipments and things like that, cutting dead miles, um, standardized packaging and things to increase your load fill, um, you know, and then working with your suppliers to buy the best equipment and uh, working with the best suppliers to innovate those solutions and share loads and things which, you know, we, we do with some of our uh, partners as well. So, you know, it's about understanding supply chain and, and, and fully carbon mapping it, it, you know, which is a, which is a challenge. But, it, you know, it can be done and then start to look to say, where can you get the biggest bang for your buck to, to make carbon reductions? And to Anand's point, 60 percent comes from from supply chain and logistics. So, you know, it's it's a really big area and a, a really key focus area for ourselves. Just a question on that one, um, Dan. It's it's obviously very important that people understand it. Procurement hasn't got a legacy of scientific backgrounds. So, you know, we don't we don't have a profession full of people that are qualified to measure carbon footprints. Um, there's a big gap there. How do you um, how do you join the two up within within Sainsbury's? How, how do you work around that? Yeah, I think it's a good, good question, Jonathan. I mean, I, I've always seen procurement as a as an enabler within the business you know we don't we can't do everything on our own we need other experts with us to help deliver that that is why procurement is in the ideal position to help deliver sustainability solutions to the business because we're the ones talking to the suppliers uh, the, the suppliers will be coming to us with innovation um, and we've got the experience within the business to deal with those logistics and supply chain challenges that we that we get as well. So we're more of a, a you know it's more of a one team approach with us helping lead on the supplier front to make sure that we can deliver that value. Great. Okay, that's that's great answer. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so I have um, Eshwar in the um, in the in the Q and A has mentioned COVID nineteen bringing supply chain in focus. Governments are starting to allocate. Um, budgets what would the roadmap be for future supply chains and i'd like to add this into one of my um one of my questions that i was going to ask what challenges uh, what opportunities should we be looking for from this is there a potential for um incentivizing sustainable supply change is there a uh, potential for business rate benefits for people that merge as um Eshwa has mentioned there. What, what's your view on it? Um, I think, in all honesty, that would be a fantastic opportunity for us to work better together. We've, for years, and, and I'm going to use Sainsbury's as, as an example, um, if we look at going down their primary logistic route, we would get an incentive anyway in regards to coordinating with them or a backload potentially where you get these type of rates on what we do. And it's kind of already there in that industry where you're working together but it's never been a primary focus. And I think now going forward, we have to not be so siloed in, I do my supply chain this way, so you can't know what I do. Um, we should be more of a, you know, Tesco's, for example, do this, or another distributor does this. Why don't we work together and actually consolidate more, more groupage loading, more, as we've already previously mentioned, working together to fill those trucks, fill those container ships to the maximum weight we can and making sure that we're not distributing empty miles that are contributing more to CS2 or carbon footprints. Great answer. And I think getting around a table and maybe having some focus on, on things. Do we see anything within any of your industries from 
governments, um, you know, bringing people together, or is it through people like SIPs with you know webinars and membership base and supply chain talk? Is that is that how we're talking to each other? Is there anything centrally led? I can I can comment on that. If you think about uh, what Suraj just mentioned, uh, CPG manufacturers and retailers have had a long-standing collaborative environment when they do category planning and category management. Think about trade promotions. You know, the the the, the CPG guys are sitting in a retailer's office planning that how they do it together. So the, the, the history exists of such collaboration that's what I just mentioned. It just needs to extend to this carbon footprint conversations. And the other thing that we are seeing as, as neutral observers from the outside who service the supply chain industry, we are seeing increased ask for collaboration capabilities between trading partners in the supply chain. And those are because if a disruption takes place, if, if, if a truck uh, that a supplier has dispatched to my store is for whatever reason not able to arrive on time and it's carrying perishables, both parties stand to lose. And instead of finger pointing, now they're saying, what is the best way for us to have a conversation about this and resolve that disruption? And because the, the imperatives of uh, sustainability are on, are on both shoulders, and that truck that is going from a supplier to a consumer, not a consumer, but to a retailer, let's say, is both people's responsibility. They are beginning that conversation. I know because a lot of our customers and we, we supply, we, we help suppliers and, and, and shippers in, in the same vein, ask us, now, now that you know exactly how our shipments are going from A to B, are you able to map out the carbon footprint of that shipment so that we can measure and then we can proactively have a discussion amongst ourselves as to how to plan the next set of routes for the next couple of weeks in a better way to reduce the carbon footprint. So these conversations are taking place, but talks like this are supremely important where you are bringing disparate parties together to have a conversation. The government will come into this because they've already mandated scope one and scope two emissions. It's only a matter of time before scope three, namely everything transportation and supply chain related emissions today are outside of the purview of, uh, of regulations. It's going to be regulated. It's going to be mandated. Europe perhaps will lead the way, in which case, guess what? All bets are off. Everybody has to talk to everyone to lift up the supply chain and make sure that the best plans are put into place to deal with it, to get efficiency out of it and reduce costs. Great. Thank you. Um, we've got a question in the chat from Ashley, um, at, uh, and it's a good question. If change is inevitable and a constant fixture, why are we consumers meant to trust? What are we meant to trust from a supply chain business? If everything is adapting for the better, but nothing's getting better, how are we meant to adapt as fast as the companies who represent and control our habits as a consumeristic society? So it's a big question there. It's it's about, OK, back to that soundbite thing. How can we trust this um, if change is constant? Are things getting better? Are we starting to turn a corner from um, people on, on the front line? Michael, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, and I think um, change, change is inevitable, uh, as Ashley said, and I think um, the consumers' trust in the supply chain, uh, you know, comes from a reliability, a, a consistency, and a delivering what they're expecting. Um, I think supply chain has been brought to the forefront in the last couple of years. You probably would never have seen so many articles about it ten years ago, um, and from a number of different reasons. And so, uh, the, the consumers' trust in the supply chain has probably been uh, damaged over the last couple of years because everything's being blamed on it. You know, it's always a supply chain problem that we've run out of batteries or we've run out of chips or we've run out of food. And and it, it's obviously a wide uh, reaching term, the supply chain. And I think that's where the consumers, you know, we do a good job at, I think, promoting supply chain around the UK, but globally, you know, maybe the un understanding of it needs to Im improve. Um, and I think in terms of adapting being able to move as fast as the companies, the companies will move as fast as either policy or consumer demand tells it to move. You know, the company, if a company can continue to make money by doing the same thing, it probably will. Um, so it's really a case of who's 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 leading who. Is it the consumer or is it the, the producer? And I suspect in most cases it is the consumer. So if, they, if people want to see change, 
uh, whether that's through sustainability or ethical supply chains, then they need to demand that both from the way that they purchase products, but also from their, you know, from governments and both the UK government or wherever they're living and consuming. The pressure needs to come from the top, from a government policy and from the bottom, from capitalist markets and, and choosing who we're going to buy from. Perfect. Thank you. So I, uh, what are your customers saying to you? Are they are they trusting what you're doing? Are there other actions um, speaking um, louder than your words or what you're doing? I think like most people, especially during the COVID um, period, we were running very, very close on just in time deliveries or unfortunately there were times where we just couldn't get there for a number of reasons of the logistics network was, was full, the depots were full. Um, but for us, it was a, we must operate as normal as we possibly can to try to rebuild any trust that we may have potentially inflicted in regards to a late delivery or anything like that. Um, the best way for us, obviously, as a business was to just the communication. And I think like most things, we just had to keep going. Um, overall, I think as a business and, and as a supply chain, uh, we have done a fantastic job in regards to making sure that consumers still had their goods uh, and that we kept things moving. It wasn't perfect um, and definitely had some feedback of this isn't great but we always found a way around making sure that things were delivered um, and as time has now gone on we're there to strive for that on time in full customers are happy consumers are happy and we have to work on rebuilding that trust so and that's what we do as a business and as a supply network great i, th I think that uh, i think your points are really well made actually and there were some really challenging times you know there was uh, labour shortages, there were actual shipping um, blockages, you know, it, it was a nightmare of a time which so many com companies battled to get through really well. I think one outcome from it is that more than ever before, procurement and supply has a voice at the table. It's front and centre of strategy. It is time for the profession to sort of ride that wave um, so how are we going to do that? How are we going to um, build a uh, sustainable, ethical supply chain internally? What are we going to be talking about? What's our good news story for the board that we're now sat at? Anand. Listen, the trust of a customer is a very fragile thing. It's a fleeting thing. All it takes is one recall and suddenly you're the bad person. I and mean, there's no question about that. I see that as a consumer uh, myself, right? I mean, I get irritated. Uh, it, you know, when things get delayed, it's not the delay that irritates me. It's the fact that I don't even know that there is a delay. And I only find out that there is a delay after the delay has happened. Why can't you tell me what is going on? So, so therefore, what has to happen is, and then, and then the customers, these consumers these days have got all the, I mean, the, the biggest disruption to supply chains, uh, ladies and gentlemen, happened with the invention of the smartphone. That's when the consumers really got into your business like you won't believe. They know exactly what product of yours is available where more than you do behind your own four walls. So therefore, the only way to win the trust is to work at the speed of the consumer. And as hard as that sounds, that's the only option that we, that we all have. And for that to happen, thank, I mean, thanks to technology, it is possible. The same technology that has enabled them to be so, uh, you know, for a lack of a better word, influential in your business decisions is the same information that you have to be able to respond to that. So you have to, your, your supply chains have to be resilient. By that, we mean all those wonderful things we talked about, nearshoring all of the above, knowing, knowing who your suppliers are, tier two, tier three at all times, having a strategy to be able to fulfill the needs of the consumer by informing them ahead of time what's going on, having a constant visibility in your supply chain so you know where your goods are at any given point in time so that you can give them a very good ETA or, or expected time of arrival and, and things like that. So it is a constant thing that organizations have to do when customers have got an incredible choice as to where they go for their next purchase. Keeping them with you requires you to be working at their speed, which means having resilient supply chains and, and making sure that your planning and execution cycles are really close with each other enabled by 
information that you should have that your customer always has. True. Thanks, Anand. And uh, um, it's a good point. And obviously, the customer success is important. See, it's imperative. Um, but but Dan, back to the point around you know the seat at the table, um, really in focus now. How can we ensure that what we keep doing is sustainable and ethical um, within the profession? I think um, communication. It sounds really simple, right? But talking, um, talking to people, um, communicating, and even from our business, you know, we. we probably could sell a lot more of what we're actually doing so you know um, consumers are aware of you know the, the, the work that's going on behind the scenes to, to, to drive this as well so um, communication with suppliers innovation um, and, and driving that innovation and doing things in a different way so you know measuring and and communication is probably the two key things uh, I would say if you to, to drive what you need to do measuring effectively so that you can then make change uh, and impact impact that by whatever means digital twinning or um, you know, testing new routes to market, dual sourcing, um, and those kind of things. But I think communication is really the key thing. We keep communicating to our consumers because they care about it. And and uh, uh, and like uh, Anand said, if you're going to be late, so long as you're telling people that what's going on, it's not so bad as it just nothing turning up, right? Um, so um, I think those are the two key things I would say that we need to keep doing and do more of um, uh, moving forward to, to really drive this forward. Great. Good question in the chat from uh, Eshwar. What kind of collaboration is in place between in industry and academia? Now, I know uh, that at Sainsbury's, for example, you have an apprenticeship scheme, um, but that for me is, you know, ensuring that your future leaders are proficiently qualified um, within the profession. So that's showing that it's working. Um, what about around, around the rest of the table? What what other links in with education? How, how, how are you... Um, ensuring that that the teams are continuing to develop so this is a more considered subject uh, i can i mean we we um we have obviously uh, internships and relationships with academia because what we in supply chain have to solve are problems that are not yet been defined so we have to be supremely agile i mean the kind of disruptions we are seeing two years ago i wouldn't have predicted I've been in this industry for the past 25, 20 plus years. I would not have predicted the kind of significant disruptions that we are seeing. The key is there's no way to predict all these disruptions. All you can do is be prepared to act on that. That requires a new thinking, a new way of thinking, and a close relationship with academia is supremely important. Everything that we offer on our platform is underpinned by significant uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches, data quality, creating right data for our customers to use in their planning and execution processes is the unique thing that we offer. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, all these things are moving literally at the speed of light, and there's no way that we ourselves can keep up with it. So we have uh, the relationship with academia to make sure uh, that there's a second aspect to this. Okay. Supply chain is always seen, has always been seen as this stoic, boring, not fun, not sexy enough of an industry. People don't work for Tesla because it's a car manufacturing company. They work for Tesla because it's a very sexy computer science organization or a technology company. And, and where supply chain is today and where it will go tomorrow, it, it is. And if you look at the math and the algorithms behind the scenes in supply chain, they are some of the most amazing, most difficult problems to solve. Brightest of the minds work in this. We just need to make it very exciting and interesting for them. What better way to do that than to be partnering with the academia and getting them young and showing them that this is actually a viable path. The supply chain, logistics, transportation are not boring industries, but very exciting industries for you to look forward to is something that is a significant benefit. And I would encourage every supply chain organization to be very close to the academia and the universities. Great. That's really good to hear. And uh, yeah, ha having that professional um background qualification really does give the endorsement and um, really good question in that in the chat from um where are we i've lost it uh excuse me carl morgan um so this will be our last question i would say before we wrap up um time is flying when i pick up a product in a supermarket i can judge it by the red amber green so i can see the fat sugar salt etc and base my decision accordingly yet i have no idea of what carbon footprint is Maybe willing to pay extra for a product with a lower footprint, but there isn't the information or visibility. 
can we get those? Would that would that make it past the branding and marketing teams, the product teams that put things on shelves? Just a quick 30 seconds each there on that one. I would buy something. Soraya? Yeah, um, in all honesty, I, I probably would as well um, because the information is there. The information on, on quality is there. Um, the green light, red light, amber light was, was pushed, I, I want to say, years ago about the whole government transparency on fat sugars. So if, if that's going to be led, then then yeah, why not? I mean, we shouldn't have um, any of us, we shouldn't have anything to hide in our supply chain. We should be striving for the future and sustainability. So yes, I I'd happily put it on. <laughs> That's a good point, actually. It it's transferable, isn't it? Whether you're looking at clothing, cars, whatever, um, it, it, could, it could go across. Dan, what's your view on it? Um, I think it's a good idea. Um, I think it's, it gets challenging when it's not all your own products, though. That's the, that's the difficulty. When you're getting from from suppliers and you know how do you kind of measure that to ensure what actual information you're getting is actually accurate you know? so so on that front can you um propose it for sainsbury's own products within sainsbury stores and um, we can say that we we it was born today oh, i can't do that i don't work on the food side either so uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay michael your view on it quickly please yeah i think um it was you touched on the fact that the red amber green and the sugar and fats came from government policy comes back to the point that you know, if we're going to make real changes i think it really needs to come from a policy perspective um and uh, yes the the voters you know they decide on the policy ultimately if, if, if enough voters want something then the governments will make it a policy to to stay in um but i, th I do think that it's, it's not going to happen overnight it's going to need to come from a lot of pressure onto the industry that's not just in food i think you mentioned there you could put it on clothing you could put it on uh, you know consumer goods you could put it on cars um the the a plus rating of your fridge has been available for a while but you don't know how many uh, how much carbon it, it took to manufacture that fridge and so actually uh, you could be buying a very efficient one that overall you know total life um of the of the product is, is worse so i think it's going to come from um a lot of effort but industry pressure and consumer pressure no question about that. I mean, if you look at what Alibaba announced, they said we are going beyond scope three emissions calculation, scope three plus, they say, where they are going to look at all the people who trade on their marketplace and make sure that their carbon footprints are understood by them so that they can only they will only allow those products that actually meet a certain carbon footprint level to be sold on that. The next generation is all about this. They are most worried about carbon uh, and climate change, what it will do to them. I promise you this will happen. There will be downward pressure uh, from the people uh, and, the, and the governments will, will respond. And I'll leave, leave you with this. I think higher price for a carbon, lower carbon footprint, in uh, honest to God, is a red herring. When organic foods came about, they were more expensive than the non-organic foods. And everybody predicted that the organic foods are going to die away. Uh, no, no, they actually thrived because people knew that free range is better for not just for us to eat, but the animals themselves. Similarly, people will say lower carbon footprint is not just good for me, but it's actually good for the environment and my future. And it, I predict it's just a matter of time. Uh, my, Michael is absolutely right. It won't happen overnight. But my word, I think in my lifetime, before I move on from this planet, I will probably see red, green and uh, yellow yes. uh, stickers for carbon on our products. OK, great. So that's really positive. So um, just to just to wrap up, finish, finish off. I'm like to say thank you um, to all of my panelists. I think it's been a really good chat today. Um, lots of things. I think we could talk about this for hours. I want to finish with one word from you, from you each. And that's um, around the start of the call. We we said we were either doom or, doom or gloom or positive for the future. So um, just really quickly, Michael, doom or gloom or positive? Has to be positive. Great. Dan? Can't be positive. It can't not be positive in this uh, in this area. So definitely positivity all the way. Excellent. And absolutely positive because the information exists for us to take the right decisions. Fantastic. And last but not least, Soraya. Yeah, definitely positive. Exciting. Good. I agree. Um, thank you all very much for your time today. We we really appreciate it. We know you're very busy on the day today. Um, it's been great. Thanks to all of the. Um, the audience. We've had some really good questions. I did promise a mug 
at the start. And I think that, you know, that um, traffic light um, system that we are going to see in the Sainsbury store quite soon um, will, will be really good. So the winner's Kevin Morgan um, for that one. Next week, we have a how efficient is your supply chain webinar where the normal host will be will be back for, I think. Um, so how effective is your supply chain is the subject next week. Look forward to seeing you all there. Have a great day. Thanks very much for joining. Goodbye. Thank you all.